Once the narrative for big business growth here in the UAE was bringing the international brand into the region and grow it here. But recent years, the Emirates has proved that it can grow and scale its own success stories into multi-million dollar businesses. The latest example of this is Stars Play Arabia. It's recently signed a deal with Eand, the artist formerly known as Etty Salat, and ADQ, an Abu Dhabi-based conglomerate, and together the two will take a majority stake, 57% at a post-money valuation of $420 million, not bad, in the homegrown streaming service. So today on AB Talks, I am delighted to be joined by Maz Sheikh, the CEO and co-founder of Stars Play Arabia, to dive into this success and go back and look at the journey to here today. Maz, welcome to AB Talks. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So before we get into uh, the deal and the headlines, just for our audience who may have been living under a rock, tell them a little bit about Stars Play Arabia, you know, the number of subscribers you've got today, the countries you operate in, and indeed what your offering is. Sure. So uh, Stars Play is a homegrown uh, UAE-based um, streaming service that launched its service uh, almost eight years ago um, uh, in April 2015. Um, we are available as a service across all of Middle East, North Africa and, and Pakistan. Um, we have almost 2 million subscribers um, and uh, operating and headquartered in Abu Dhabi. So if we look at the headlines today, and I'm really keen to get into the past story, but if we look at the today, a deal, 420 million post value, uh, post money valuation. Um, you've signed the deal with E and, and with ADQ. What does that deal mean to you, to the company, but also to the UEE? Because this is a local company acquiring a major stake in a local company. That's, that's a sign of a maturing and a growing market here in the UEE, is it not? That's correct. Um, th there were so many layers to your question, yeah, Scott. I know, yeah. <laughs> but um, what it means to to me and and the employees, uh, I think, for for everyone who's been part of this this company and and the story from the very beginning, uh, for for us, it's a dream come true. You know, for us, it's a work of a lifetime uh, that's that's materialized into into uh, two strategic investors from this part of the world, uh, taking a majority stake. Uh, so, so for us, it's a dream come true. It's a validation of all the work we've done. And, and it's, it's a big testament for us because it's not someone across the pond from <laughs> across the Atlantic yeah. taking a stake in our business. It's two strategic brands from the region who know the business and who know this market, who know what we've built. Uh, coming in and, and validating uh, the, the the business that that's been created, um, and and for us as a company, what it means is is that going forward, one we have the capital that that we need yeah. uh, to continue to grow and continue to be competitive, because the marketplace is getting competitive. Um, you have Disney Plus coming into the region. You have uh, other global streaming services that might come later on. So, so it definitely gives us that capital uh, that we need to continue to grow uh, our business. But secondly, it also gives us um, the strategic collaboration and the partnerships we need to bring economies of scale to our business because sometimes money doesn't buy everything, yeah. right? And so, so if you look at the collaboration we can do with e um not only in UAE, but also in Saudi, uh, in, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Morocco, where, where the other markets EN operates in, it gives us that ability to do more and more cooperation with them from distribution point of view, from more content creation. So it gives us that uh, distribution and reach. And secondly, um, through, uh, through ADQ, it gives us the ability to work with other Abu Dhabi-based companies like Abu Dhabi Media, like Image Nation and, and 2454, we're working closely with them for creating uh, original content, for creating those, those TV shows that, that all of us watch uh, uh, passionately during Ramadan. So, so not only is it a financial investment into us, it's also uh, a strategic collaboration that gives us those economies of scale that we needed uh, to be able to compete with, uh, with global uh, platforms in this part of the world. 
At Raven Business, we're very keen on lifting others up. And what I like about what you just said or what I love about this whole thing is you're talking about, you know, a rising tide lifting all boats in a way. You're talking about, you know, um, Image Nation. You're talking about other independent producers that right. in this region that can benefit from this. Um, and I think I know your answer to this question, but is one of the benefits of this strategic partnership is the fact that the opportunity and the prosperity stays within the region. It's not just you've sold out to some conglomerate in the US and then all the money streams and flows out of the region. It actually stays in the region and can c continues to create success and opportunity here. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's happening at so many levels, um, Scott. So if you, if you build on what you were just saying about Image Nation, you know, today we are producing an original show with Image Nation. 80% of that show was produced and shot in, in UAE with UAE talent. There are a few episodes that we are producing outside of UAE, uh, one, one in Egypt specifically, but 80% of that uh, content creation is happening in UAE on screen and behind the screen talent uh, from UAE. So, so there's that element of you know, keeping the value here. Then there's this um, se second element of um, the confidence in the ecosystem, right? Until now, you've had very successful exits uh, happening in this part of the world. Uh, Kareem obviously was was a very successful one. You've had Souk. Yeah. So these are a few startups that we've looked up to, you know, as we were building ours. Yeah. Um, that someday, you know, we will we will get the same vote of confidence, and um, and it's good to see. You know, uh, global yet local brands. Um, you know, taking taking uh, a position in yeah. in a startup like ours because Atisalat is definitely one of the e end uh, is definitely yeah. one of the global uh, telcos. You know, um, uh, one of the top ten brands. Uh, um, and and for them to take this uh, uh, stake in us is is a is is very encouraging. For the for the wider ecosystem, tech ecosystem in in the region, feels like the the ecosystem is evolving and evolving on a more local level within the region. So it's it, you know it needed that maybe that infusion of capital from outside right. to keep the the patient alive or stable yeah. <laughs> or growing. And now the patient's actually quite fine. There's a, there's a there's a strong support system and it can actually yeah. start. And I and I think it also. Um, uh, you know, it also signals uh, that uh, that groups like E and now are ready to not only evolve their brand but also evolve their broader strategy. So if you if you look at how they've reorganized and restructured themselves, it's very clear that that they're going beyond telecom services. You know, they they're focusing on digital, but they're also evolving their fintech uh, strategy. So I think that signal is very important for the wider tech ecosystem, not just streaming or media companies, not just gaming companies, but even the, the, the fintech uh, startups. So that's today. <laughs> Let's dial it back. Let's go back in history. Every superhero has an origin story. What was, what was Star, Star's Play Arabia's origin story? What was the problem you set out to solve? So uh, the, the problem we, we were solving for was that we had seen uh, in this part of the world that uh, that Hollywood content has a certain uh, premium uh, nature to it. But but if you wanted um, to watch the latest movies and TV shows, you had to subscribe to a package that was 300 dirhams plus. Yeah. And and that's really the problem we were solving for is making that entertainment, those premium movies and TV shows, making them uh, affordable and making them available to the masses. Yeah. Uh, it just so happened that in, in 2014, if you were going to launch a new TV business, you're not going to do it on satellite. You're, you're clearly going to do it on, on uh, as, as the industry calls it now, OTT, over yeah, the yeah. top, yeah. Or, or subscription video on demand. The, the, but the challenge at that time was um, there weren't that many believers in, in that business at that time, you know, eight years ago. And, and what we realized is looking at the success of YouTube and successful Arabic multi-channel networks on YouTube back in 2013 and 14, what we realized is that the consumer behavior is there because YouTube is so was so successful in the region already. And, and infrastructure was ready. 
uh, especially in the Gulf markets uh, in, in, in UAE, Kuwait, and Saudi, we saw the infrastructure was ready because that's how people were consuming content on, on YouTube. So the only thing that wasn't ready was perhaps the industry itself. Yeah. People yeah. like myself who were working in the industry that, that were perhaps in denial. That, leg <laughs> that legacy issue, we've always done it this way, so we'll never change what we do. <laughs> Absolutely. So there's that. There's also um, that it's not going to happen to us. Yeah. Uh, that it's, it's happening somewhere in Western Europe. It's happening in US, but it's not going to happen here because infrastructure isn't ready or the behavior isn't quite there. Yeah. In fact, it was quite the opposite. You know, the region is blessed with a very young population. Yeah. So the shift in, in, in behavior was happening much faster than we thought. And, and then the infrastructure, especially in the Gulf countries, was on par and has been on par with Western Europe and, and U.S. So there was no reason for the adoption not to happen. It's just that the industry wasn't ready. I remember 10 years ago working for a title over in Abu Dhabi and they were writing then going, yeah, e-commerce is not really ever going to take off <laughs> in, the, in the UAE because, because of X, Y, Z, we don't have a unified postal. So all that sort of thing. Yeah. Like you look at it today, you look at Noom and you look at Amazon and you look at Souk and you look at, yeah, yeah, yeah you got that one wrong, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. So there was a little bit of that. So that's yeah. the problem we set out to solve, but it just so happened that we solved it uh, over the top you know, through streaming. But the business problem remained the same, making entertainment affordable and available to the masses. Uh, so that stars play Arabia's uh, origin story, but what's yours? Were, what called you to entrepreneurship like back in 2015? What was the bell that rang inside you that said, right, I'm going to do this? So, um, so my story uh, as an entrepreneur is perhaps not uh, your stereotypical story of, uh, of, of someone building a business from zero, where you know where they get a an idea while they're showering in the morning and uh and uh, there's a light bulb uh so it, this was more sort of um having done a couple of startups in silicon valley in in the 90s with with mixed success um i wasn't the ceo but i was part part of the team um and so so i always had this in me uh to to do another startup and and but this time around i was Hit, you know, I was 44, a lot more gray hair, <laughs> a lot more gray hair and, and uh, two older kids, a lot more responsibility and a lot more commitments. So, so the stakes seemed a lot higher, yeah. but at the same time, I felt um, uh, I had more experience and more credibility, more contacts in, 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 in the industry. And, and then, you know, with, with every successful journey, there's a lot, uh, of right timing, right place, uh, a lot of luck, destiny, you know, Allah, whatever you, um, whatever your faith is. So, so there was a lot of that fell, fell into, uh, place with, with my journey as well. And I was fortunate, uh, in two ways. One, I, I had a set of colleagues and management team that uh, that believed in in the journey and we did it together yeah. so that gave us a lot more credibility and secondly in that journey we 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 met with a gentleman named uh, Peter Aikland a very successful media investor executive himself out of out of Sweden um, that gave us the seed capital to get us started uh, before institutional investors came yeah. into the picture so so the, the, lots of th things came together in making this successful. Do you think he would have given you that seed capital if you hadn't got those gray hairs or indeed <laughs> if you've not got that, you know, because for a lot of startups, one of the questions that VCs ask is the management, they look to the management right. team. You almost like you had all that down coming to the, the, the startup journey sort of later on in life, shall we say? Yeah, I, I think having, having that depth of experience in, in the, in the management team that, that came together to build this, uh, to build this company um, is really the reason why the venture was backed initially by Peter, and and then later on um, with with Stars and and GE that that uh, that uh, that were the Series A yeah. investors. So the the management team had a lot to do with it. I think the region had a lot to do with it as well because they they saw an opportunity in, in this region. They they saw. They, they, they'd, they'd seen the fundamentals of uh, an economy with Western Europe or North American uh, KPIs, if you will, in terms of income levels, infrastructure, 
the growth opportunity. Yet, in a lot of ways, uh, there was a, there was white space yeah. and untapped opportunity. Yeah. And so it was it was an equally attractive market for them to enter into versus continuing to invest in, say, North America or Western Europe, where things were a lot more competitive. Talking about those gray hairs, I mean, obviously, we've got the backdrop right now, the great resignation. So there's lots of people, my end of the spectrum, as well as you know, young entrepreneurs who are thinking they want to discover their passion, they want to start, start their own businesses. So they'll take some hope from, from that last answer. <coughs> However, we do hear a lot, and I hear a lot um, of what's almost been described as toxic positivity, that everything's going to be rosy and that as an entrepreneur, you're going to make millions. Now, in Star, Star, Star Plays, Arabia's case, you have made millions. But was everything rosy? I mean, how's the journey been? What have the mistakes on the way been? And what, what have they taught you? Again, another multi-layered question, I do that. <laughs> sure. Uh, yes, so, so the journey is, is not easy. Um, and, and like my younger one at that time, he was, uh, he was nine years old. He, he said, Baba, I've read a statistic that over 97% of the businesses that start fail within one year. And, and, and statistically, thanks for, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and statistically, that's correct. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot that do become successful as well. So yes, the, the odds are stacked against you when, when you're building something from scratch. Um, but, but I think one has to look deep inside, uh, on, uh, and, and look deep inside and dig deep inside to figure out what is it that bigger purpose that, that you're going for. You know, some entrepreneurs do want to change the world. They yeah. do want to employ thousands of people and, and impact, you know, millions of lives. Um, and, and others could have a much more humble aspiration. So, so for me, uh, it was, doing something that that perhaps creates a legacy that that leaves a little mark behind and then more than anything else i just wanted to be part of a venture that starts from zero and see it through and more than anything else that was my big passion or big, build something it, it, to your design as opposed to yeah. external design shall we say well I, and i think there's also something about when you when you walk into an office and you look around whether there's five people working there or 500 people working there and saying and thinking to yourself that you know you built this and you were part of this growth um that's in, that in itself is very very rewarding um so so for me it felt like you know when i was 44 um i i you know uh, thank God I had a very successful professional career. Um, life was very, very settled. But at the same time, there was something very unsettling, uh, inside, inside me where, where it felt like it's now or never. Yeah. It's, it becomes more and more difficult, uh, to, to start this entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journey, you know, in your fifties. And, and not that it can't be done, but the stakes are much higher. So I, I yeah. felt like it has to be now or never. I was going to say, because that is, you know, you were all, you know, in terms of an employee, shall we say, you were at the top of your game. You were CEO of a successful um, TV, TV company. Um, why was there such a powerful call with inside yourself to go, do you know what, I'm going to leap off the cliff? Because I, I, we, we talk about startups all the time. I'm in awe of anyone that has the courage to actually do that, and particularly at our end of the spectrum. You're sickeningly younger than me. But, you know, you've got kids, you've got responsibilities, you've got the mortgage, you've got the house, you've got the car paint, all that sort of thing. What was it really inside you that was like, no, throw all that out, I'm going to go and build my own thing? <laughs> Well, so for me personally, um, there, there, I felt like, um, there was a generational burden where my, my brother, my dad, and even my grandfather had tried various entrepreneurial, uh, ventures in their lives. And my dad ended up, you know, working, you know, most of his life, he was a chemical engineer. He worked in Dubai, actually, in right. the 70s. Right. Uh, he set up a few plants that are still there in Sheikh Zayed Road. Um, and so he spent most of his life working and he, he made attempts at, at starting his own ventures, uh, but not successful. Same thing um, with others in my family. So I, I felt like there was this generational burden uh, for me where I could, 
you know, get the monkey off our <laughs> back <laughs> once and for all. Um, and, and I felt like I was running out of time, yeah. that it had to be done. Um, and then I also uh, looked at my kids and uh, I'm, you know, I felt like, what, what are we teaching our kids? Yeah. What am I teaching my kids? And uh, is it that uh, always take the safest route there is? Uh, because I think oftentimes um, what seems like the safest and the most uh, cautious approach or option at that point in time in the long run ends up being um, perhaps the risky one. So who knows, had I stayed there, maybe I would have gotten fired a year later anyway, and I'd be looking for a job, right? So, so I think it, it, one has to assess what that inner purpose is, what that deeper purpose is. And, and for me, it was a lot of things coming together, including having a chip on my shoulder that I need to do it and prove yeah. this to myself and others in the family. One thing that doesn't quite get covered enough, perhaps, when we talk about startups is the sacrifices that are required because it isn't all rose petals. And right. um, Have the sacrifices been worth it? How's the journey been? And another multi-layered question. And if you could go back to 2015 and talk to Maz in 2015, what would you tell him? <laughs> There's so many things. Um, so is, is the journey worth it? Uh, I think for me personally, uh, looking back now, it does feel like it's worth it, um, the, the, because the, the price you pay and the cost is so different. It's, you can't quantify it. You know, it's, it's a very uh, experiential sort of uh, cost. So what I mean by that is, you know, as a family, we had to adjust our lifestyle. You know, you, you don't take the vacations you were supposed to. You, you no longer have the two cars you used to, right? So the, the life is still um, going well, but you have to make choices and you have to make uh, adjustments. So I think we adjusted our, as a family, we adjusted our lifestyle on every aspect. The only thing that we didn't adjust for was adjust as, as the, the schooling or the, the kids, yeah. uh, the school that kids were going exactly to. Exactly that, yeah. At all other levels, you, you have to make sacrifices and you have to make those adjustments. So the, I think the, the one thing I would tell uh, the Mahas from 2014 is uh, perhaps not underestimating uh, the toll this journey takes on, on, on the people around you. Yeah. Uh, so, so for example, you know, my, my dad at that time was 83 and and he 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 passed away while we were fundraising and he was so worried about the, the my decision and and what i was going through and uh and and you know that's something i have to live with for the rest of my life so so the so the decisions you make as an entrepreneur yes there's a lot of energy you have a lot of adrenaline so you'll keep going yeah but the impact it's having on people around you and your loved ones, that's perhaps one thing that a lot of people underestimate, or I underestimate it. That's sage advice. Um, I'm sure your father would be proud of where you are today, though. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about culture, and, you know, and we've got uh, the noted management consultant, Peter Drucker, used to talk about you know, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. You know, for, for, um, how much do you agree or disagree with that statement? And what's been the secret sauce inside the Stars Play Arabia office as you've grown? Sure. So, uh, you know, I'll have to be honest, Scott. I, I, um, I never really understood uh, what management consultants meant by culture. And, and, uh, and I think as we have uh, built this organization, I've, I've come to appreciate that statement more and more. Um, if I had to put one word on our culture, it, it has to be execution or, or experimentation. Because having that in our uh, DNA, having that as a culture of focus on execution and focus on experimentation, uh, testing, I think has been a big part of, um, of, of our success. So, so I do agree with, with, with that statement now uh, the importance of culture and, and, and culture means different things to yeah. different organizations, right? Yeah. For us, it meant having a culture of 
ownership, having a culture of execution, and and realizing that um, that uh, we will make mistakes. But we, as much as we believe in our ideas and we have conviction in our beliefs, it's equally important to have that humility to accept that you've made a mistake so yeah. you can go back and adjust. And that's what I meant by having that culture of testing and culture of experimentation. Another multi-layered question for you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, how important is it for, for your employees to feel, um, and your colleagues and your team to feel that they can make mistakes and they can be wrong and they can experiment? Um, and that's one aspect. And then how do you actually ensure that they do have that sense of ownership in the project? How do you make them feel that they've got skin in the game? Sure. So um, as far as skin in the game is concerned, you know, that's one way we, we, we achieve that is, is all our employees are shareholders as well. Okay, right. So, uh, so uh, throughout the organization, every employee is, uh, is a shareholder. So we've, we've tried to maintain that, uh, that, that uh, mindset that you're not an employee, you're also an owner. Yeah. And even going forward, uh, our new shareholders, um, EN, uh, as well as ADQ, they've been supportive of this approach and supportive of this plan because this is how you create that culture of ownership. So that's been extremely important for us. Um, the second part uh, is, is how do you create that environment where, where uh, testing and experimentation is, is encouraged and, and welcomed? I think that for us, I, I, uh, I would admit that it's not perfect uh, because we, we're, we're a small organization. While we make a lot of mistakes and adjust from it, it, it also sets us back uh, because there's, there's very little room for mistakes. So, so we are still trying to figure out what that right balance is. We're still trying to figure out uh, how to create that right culture. But but I would say that what we've been good at is is testing and experimentation, and uh, and and learning from it and adapting from it. We'll have lots of entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs dialing in and watching this interview, particularly in twenty twenty two. How's the landscape now? Do you think compared to the landscape you entered in twenty twenty you know, in twenty fifteen? You were an entrepreneur startup in twenty fifteen. What's the landscape now for 2022, the ecosystem, you know, let's say we talked about the ecosystem, the environment and the support for startups these days? Uh, look, it's, uh, it's completely different. It's, um, the, the system has evolved uh, a lot uh, more than what, what we had six, seven years ago. So you have regional um, VC firms that are quite active now. You have um, uh, institutional investors, uh, both who were traditional sovereign wealth funds or private equity firms that have now set up uh, investment funds for uh, early stage uh, companies. And ADQ is a good example of that. And then now you have, um, uh, you know, leading groups like e and as well as ST, Saudi Telecom um, company, STC in Saudi, that have set up their own investment arms and they're quite active in investing in not only in telecom related uh, b startups and businesses, but adjacent uh, areas. So I think the ecosystem has involved, uh, evolved considerably. And on top of that, and this is perhaps, you know this much better than I do, there's uh, from, from the overall government level, both at the emirate level as well as the federal level, there's a lot more focus on on the tech yeah. sector. And, and I, I use tech sector more generally speaking, but I, what I mean is, is that SMB sector, that high growth entrepreneurial uh, uh, sector. So, um, so I feel the, the, the support is coming from all different levels. And, and even the, the financial uh, traditional banks have changed their mindset. It used to be that it was difficult to get loans for, for businesses that weren't quite profitable. Mm -hmm. But now there are new platforms that have come, uh, that, that have come into existence. For example, uh, we, we worked with, uh, with Ruya Partners. They're an Abu Dhabi-based um, uh, investment platform that lend money to high-growth uh, companies like ourselves that are not quite profitable, mm -hmm. but need of uh, growth. They, so of they'll fund the potential. Exactly. Yeah. 
which t- your traditional retail or commercial banks wouldn't. Yeah. And, and so, so I feel in that way, a uh, lot of aspects of the system uh, have come together from, from investment, equity investment to, to uh, lending as well. Uh, last question on startups before we return to Stars Play. Your top three tips for anybody, you know, for those would-be dreamers out there right now from your experience. So my number one would be um, understand what what drives your passion. What's that bigger purpose? Uh, that's very that's that's extremely important because you you will need to rely on that when things get difficult. Number two, um, you can't do it all yourself. So surround yourself with the right people. There's there's a lot of talk about how uh, Steve Jobs built Apple, and and he did, but he couldn't have done it without Wozniak, yeah. as we know. <laughs> and 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 you know, th- th- there are very few Steve Jobs, you know, who can be technologist, marketing specialist, yeah. product visionary. So most of us are not Steve Jobs, and so f- surround yourself with the right people figure out what your strengths are and have the right people around you. And, and, and finally, uh, I would say the third one is as much as it's important to have uh, conviction in your beliefs and ideas, it's equally important to, be, to have that humility to accept that you've made a mistake and it needs to be corrected or adjusted. I could almost be a mic drop moment there. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you two final questions. Um, what's next for Stars Play Arabia then? So we've got this uh, deal in place, um, which gives you a healthy platform to springboard into the future. But what is that future? What are the trends? What are you going to be leaning into? What can we expect for the Stars Play for the rest of 2022, for example? So we, we see two areas uh, of, of growth, and, uh, and, and we see this coming from our fans as well. Uh, one is Arabic content. Um, we think that there's a tremendous opportunity to create local stories, uh, but tell them at a global stage. Um, so so we, we feel, and this is one of the things we are trying to do with Abu Dhabi Media as well as Image Nation, is to create those stories, create those local stories uh, that are told with the, with the production quality uh, of that, that, that's worthy of being on a global stage. Yeah. So, so Arabic content is, is one area of growth for us. And the other is, uh, is sports. Um, we've, we, we've had several successful sporting events in, in, in 21 and 2022. We, we carried the Cricket World Cup yeah. as well as the FIFA World Cup qualifiers. And, and those two were very successful events for us. And we're going to continue to build on, on sports as well. So 2015 to 2022, we see where you come from to where you are today. I sit back down with you in 2029, 2030. What's your world look like there? Um, I, hope, I hope we're still one of the leading um, uh, SVOD services in the region. Uh, I see ourselves uh, focused uh, on, on the MENA uh, region and Pakistan. So that continues to be our, uh, I think that'll continue to be our, um, uh, our focus. And, and if the dreams align and our shareholders uh, believe in, in, in the timing, we want to list ourselves uh, one day and, and be a listed company. And then when do you buy Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you lend me some money. <laughs> <laughs> Maz, thank you so much for joining us on AB Talks today and congratulations on all of the success today. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for having me. Thank you.